All right, this video is just to show people that there is genetically engineered trees. All right, I'm at the New Jersey Forest Education Research or Resource Center, whatever. And what they're doing here is they're growing these willow poplars. All right, so this is willow poplar bioenergy crops. This isn't science fiction. There are currently hundreds, perhaps thousands of test plots of GE trees already being grown in the open around the world. My name is David Suzuki. I am, by training and profession, a geneticist. And for 25 years, I had an active career in science, once having the largest genetics lab in Canada. I'm narrating this film because I'm concerned about the unseemly haste with which my colleagues and my peer group seem to be ready to rush in and begin to apply ideas in this revolutionary area, to apply ideas that I think are far too early to expose people either in our drugs, in our food, or out in open fields. This one gene, one protein, one trait caricature of how genetics works, that's the whole foundation of the biotechnology industry is a complete misrepresentation of everything we know about how genetics in complex organisms actually works. Biotechnologists think genes are genes. It doesn't matter where you stick them and they'll just function the way they normally do. Any geneticist who thinks about that should know better. Genes don't function alone. They function within the context of the entire genome. Nature acts on the entire genome because after fertilization there are whole sets of genes turned on and off in the proper sequence so that you get the development of a complete organism. So that whole orchestration is an integrated uh, genome that acts as a complete entity. To take a gene out of a fish and stick it into a plant means the fish gene suddenly wakes up and goes where the hell am I? Who are all these other genes around me? Because you've altered the context within which that gene is found. The promoters of this technology would have us believe that genetic engineering is somehow more scientifically precise than traditional forms of breeding of plants and animals, and that's simply not true. Genetic engineering is an inherently uncertain process. It's inherently hazardous when Genes from various flowering plants and bacteria and what have you are forced into the embryos of either our food crops or of, tree sp or of the cells from living trees. Um, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know where those genes will land. And they don't know what effects it'll have on the underlying processes of gene expression that make a corn plant a corn plant or that make a poplar tree, a poplar tree. One of the main problems is that those pushing the benefits of genetic engineering stand to gain enormously from it. Today, products of biotechnology are being incorporated into our food, sprayed onto our fields, and engineered into our medicines without our knowledge, with little public discussion 
and with the active support and funding of governments. Even though there are profound health, ecological, and economic ramifications of this activity, the paper, timber, oil, and fruit industries are rushing ahead to genetically engineer trees. What we found through our research is that genetically engineered trees are truly the greatest threat to the world's remaining native forests since the invention of the chainsaw. Large paper, agriculture, and timber corporations are pouring vast sums of money into genetically engineering trees because they believe they will be more efficient and profitable. They hope to engineer traits so that trees kill insects. Trees resist toxic herbicides. Trees will have reduced lignin, the long fiber that gives rigidity to the tree and makes it difficult to manufacture paper. Trees that are sterile, producing no seeds, nuts, pollen, nectar, or fruit. The insertion into the cells of trees of the gene from a naturally occurring bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis, that produces Bt toxin that kills insects, would cause every leaf, flower, fruit, or grain of pollen of the tree to produce the insecticide. Advocates claim that this would decrease the need for applied chemical pesticides because pests would be exterminated by eating the tree. But geneticists know from experience that using an insecticide in this fashion selects resistant insects, putting the industry on a treadmill of requiring an endless string of different, often more toxic pesticides. Geoengineering is now defined as large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment. This is to counteract man-made climate change. This is what the Royal Society published. This is what they put out. So this is their definition, their term of geoengineering. You've got to, in a sense, engineer all these so you get the right kind of clouds for the effects we want. It is called geoengineering, fighting global warming by putting a chemical dust in the atmosphere and reflecting harmful radiation back into space. You could use barium oxide, for example, uh, which makes big fluffy clouds. You could use tiny little bits of aluminum, which is benign in the environment, and essentially manage the climate.
What we're finding in rain tests now uh, around the world is what people are calling the chemtrail geoengineering footprint of aluminum, barium, and strontium. These metals match a number of geoengineering patents that were uh, actually designed to specifically spray these metals out of airplanes uh, into the sky for the state of gold cooling the planet. When you look at airborne environmental samples and the soil and water samples that people have co collected throughout the country, you get three types of materials. Metallic salts, filaments or fibers, and engineered biologicals. Metallic salts are oxides. Aluminum, titanium, barium are three examples. And it appears now that the air around us has been filled with these metallic oxides, which are conductive, conductive particles, so the air is no longer neutral. Air is supposed to be neutral to support life. It is not supposed to be charged. So here you have a photo of this man who is a retired federal wildlife biologist and a water specialist. Lab tests from Northern California show very high levels of aluminum and barium in soil and pond water. Francis Mangles told me that at 100 micrograms per liter, when he was working for the um, federal government, you were shut down. 100 micro, I'm sorry, 1,000 micrograms per liter. So I asked him what normal is, what's tolerable, and he said 5 tenths, 0 0.5 micrograms per liter is considered normal. So here you have the findings from pond water in Mount Shasta, you can see 12,000 micrograms per liter, UG is short for microgram, which is 24,000 times normal. The natural world which gets its food from the ground is sucking this stuff up. This is a scraggly pine tree outside the post office in Cardiff, California, where I go every day. And you can see how brittle it is, Lots of needles lost. If you look closely at the needles when you stand under the tree, you see that they're all frosted with brown. Signs of tree death are these sagging limbs, these leafless, scraggly branches. You also see infestation by bugs, insects, mites, fungus. These are spider mites that have taken up in a tree that was right next to my house. The entire tree had to be felled because of these white webs in it that were killing off the tree. Here you have a phenomenon that Deborah Whitman, who's here with us today, has done a lot of research on. Um, the white, we call it the tube sock effect on trees. You see white bark. And when we tested the bark of this tree, it showed it had these readings, aluminum 387, barium at 18.4, strontium 113, and titanium 15.2. You can see again in these uh, photos the enormous scorched look. That's a very dying, very unhealthy tree. And you see this other thing called secondary growth. The tufts on the trunk poking out, that's the tree giving itself, desperately trying to give itself a second stab at life. So when you look around you and you see these little growths, Sometimes they're all the way along the trunk from the ground up. The beauty of an induced problem is that its twin is the solution. As nature begins to die, we will be told that science will have to step in to save it. Well, life itself is being killed off. Nature is being killed off. And science is replacing it with genetically engineered life. These are the trees here in Anderson, South Carolina. These are the trees here that I drive by every single day. These are the trees that I see every single day caked with fungal disease, sick, 
evidencing weak immune systems and it is I, I I don't even know the words to describe what life has become watching so many people ignore what is truly right in their face life itself is being killed off you can see it in the trees every day but people ignore it they ignore all of this fungal disease now I know that they are also dropping fungi into the atmosphere that comes down lands on the trees gets into into the soil but it's in the air and we are breathing in fungi along with the toxic chemicals and the heavy metals and biologicals yes science is stepping in arbor gen is planting genetically modified trees has been for years our EPA, our USDA, has given Arbor Gen and other biotechnology firms approval. Unregulated, no safety tests, just get out there and plant genetically modified trees, which will affect the entire ecosystem. The trees are so dry caked with disease, bark falling off, they're dying. Along with life itself, along with all of us. We're on toxic overload now. And it couldn't be more clear. It couldn't be more obvious. You're staring at it. You are staring at toxic overload in our trees. Now, it's not just coming from the geoengineering. It's also coming from the fact that they have destroyed the ozone layer. And we have uh, UV radiation that is off the charts that's burning up life. We, we are saturated in dangerous microwave frequencies that are drying out the air. But it's obvious. And, well, I guess we have handed over the world to the rich and powerful to do as they so wish. Our silence, our inaction has allowed them to create this nightmare. Our silence, our inaction gave them consent. But this has been going on for ages. Yeah, the trees are dying. So I'm just going to let you hear a little bit more about the trees everywhere dying. I hope you get this information out. Thanks, guys. I noticed when I started doing research in 2002 was that the trees in Mendocino County, Lake County, and other areas of Northern California were in extreme decline. It wasn't uh, from anything we could ascertain because it was whole suites of tree species. That means redwood trees, that means oak trees, that means manzanita, that means Douglas fir. You can see how bad the health of the trees are here because See, they don't have people in here because they're afraid these trees are going to fall on somebody. This isn't a construction area. What, what are they constructing? I don't see anything they're constructing. But you can see that every other one in this, this area, when you look up toward the top, it has so much dieback and death on it. 
every tree in this area is dying or in some sort of decline. You can see right in here, this is the sign of aging and these curled up branches right here. This is all sign of, of that this tree wasn't in good health. It's, it's doomed to come down at some point. Um, I was a weather or a biologist with the Department of Fish and Game actually for 38 years and during that time my field work uh, I started noticing a lot of plant death and die off everywhere I was going and it was getting progressively worse. I was really concerned about what's going on. I'm, I'm on the ground looking at all of this and wondering what's happening. Well, about that time, uh, the sudden oak death hit, hit California, uh, at least central California, and uh, that was, uh, you know, the big problem. But as I traveled around, I found out, well, uh, SOD is just one of the pathogens that's around, and there are a lot of them. Uh, there were similar problems going on with all of the habitats I was looking at, and it had a lot more to do than just SOD, which got me really curious. Well, I took a lot of samples, and when I, and when I took them in, all the labs would tell me was, well, it's, it's uh, either bugs or, uh, or fungus. Okay, uh, yeah, that's what's on them now, but what caused the bug and fungus invasions? You know. It has been classic that when you start having a, a, an invasion of species, it's because the, the trees are weak. Things are changing. They're stressed. And when you're talking about a stressed environment, you're talking then about uh, a really rapid uh, spread of these conditions. And the dying of the trees. And what he said was, from the cedars of Alaska to the palms of Florida, from the maples of Canada and New England to the pines and incense cedar of the Sierra Nevada, the incidence of death and decline are increasing at an alarming rate. Uh, further, uh, another study from the uh, USGS biologist or, uh, was the tree death in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California has doubled since 1983. Stress and dieback have occurred from Alaska to Mexico. Since 1997, more than 20 million hectares or 50 million acres have been affected. And it's more, uh, this was in 2009, and I haven't updated the numbers, and I'm sure it's much bigger than that now.